Now that we've explored how Maxwell's equations give us plane waves in vacuum and in single materials, we now want to think about how light propagates from one material to another. So we're interested in the relationship between electric fields and magnetic fields on opposite sides of an interface. Specifically, let's consider that we've got some sort of interface here between a material with refractive index N1, say air, and refractive index 2, say glass. What we know about this sort of situation is if we had a beam of light traveling in like this, at this angle, for in air, then in glass it's going to refract and it's not going to travel at the same angle with respect to the interface. That's Snell's law and we'll be talking about that soon. If this wave is polarized in the plane of the page, we already know that the electric field of N1 will be oriented this way and the electric field of N2 will be oriented this way, in both cases perpendicular to the k vector of the beam. And these two fields are not at the same orientation because the k vectors are not at the same orientation. If I were to zoom in on that interface, take some points just to either side of the interface, I could draw a dot over here and ask what's the electric field there. And looking at that orientation, I can see that that electric field at some instant in time, if it's pointing, say, upwards in its oscillation, it looks like that. So it's oscillating like this. Whereas on the other side of the interface, I can think about another point right here, and its electric field is not oriented exactly the same way. It's pointing more like that. And maybe it's not the same maximum amplitude of oscillation, and it's certainly not in the same direction of oscillation. So we've now got an E1 on one side of the interface, and right near it, we've got an E2, and they're not equal to each other. But surely something about the refractive index N1 and N2, and the angle of which they're approaching, uh, theta1 and theta2, that's got to dictate some relationship between these two fields. And what we want to do now is see how Maxwell's laws give us a clue about how E1 is related to E2. And as I look at that relationship, it's going to turn out that the relationship is between the perpendicular component of E1, that's the component of E1 perpendicular to the interface, and I can think about the same component for E2, and it's going to turn out that the relationship between these two is that I take the refractive index of each medium and, and square it, n1 squared and n2 squared, and that ends up to be the relationship. So it's not that E1 it's not that E1 equals E2. It's not that E1's perpendicular component equals E2's perpendicular component. It's that the perpendicular components are related by their proportionality given by the refractive indices. So where does that come from? We're going to go back to Maxwell's laws. And specifically, we're going to go to the divergence law. We're going to talk about the divergence of electric field is equal to charge density divided by epsilon naught. And we're going to consider that we're living in glass or air or materials that don't have any fixed charge in them, unbalanced charge. So we're going to refer to the only charge that comes up in these problems is that that's pulled to surfaces by electric fields, what we call polarization-induced charge density. So we've got this equation, the divergence of E is equal to the polarization-induced charge density divided by epsilon naught. Now, there's a formula that you've worked on which says that the polarization-induced charge density is given by the negative divergence of the polarization. This equation is true whether we're in medium 1 or in medium 2. The value of the polarization will be different in each medium because air and glass have different values of chi, different values of susceptibility. So in either medium, it would be true to replace p over epsilon naught with the chi value in that medium. In other words, this is equal to negative divergence of p over epsilon naught. And you can always write p over epsilon naught as the divergence, instead of p over epsilon naught, the divergence of chi e. If I just bring this term over to this side and group the two divergences together, I mathematically get that the divergence of E 
plus chi e. Now that's a quantity that equals zero. And that's just like saying that the divergence of one plus chi times e is zero. But remember, one plus chi is our definition of refractive index squared. So that's now saying that the divergence of n squared times e is zero. So we've already got an n squared times an e, which looks like the form of our equation that I've told you we're going to be ending up deriving. Now the divergence of this quantity, what does that mean? Let's zoom in again on the boundary and think conceptually about the divergence of this quantity. So if I have a point near the boundary, like this, on the left-hand side, and let's draw a little volume around it. Now what's important about this volume is that one side of it is in region one and one side of it is in region two. So now I've got this quantity n squared times the electric field. So now I'm looking at the flux out the side walls and the top walls and the front and back walls coming in and out of the page. The top and bottom walls have the same value of n. And if I make this box very small, I know that the electric field is not varying discontinuously anywhere on this left side. So the electric field on the top and electric field on the bottom are going to be, I can make them arbitrarily similar to each other. So since the n is the same on both sides, n squared e y is the same here and here to an arbitrary level of accuracy. Same thing with z coming in and out of the page. So n squared e is essentially the same in the top and the bottom, and n squared ez is essentially the same in the front and the back. But remember, I've got an n1 over here and an n2 over here. So it isn't necessarily required that the electric field in this direction, in other words, ex here doesn't have to equal ex here because n1 and n2 are not the same. That's what's special about looking in the horizontal direction of this divergence versus the vertical and the in and out of the page component. What's got to be equal on the left and the right, if I make this box arbitrarily small but still cross the boundary, is that n1 squared ex on the left has got to equal n2 squared ex on the right for a small, arbitrarily small box. Again, the argument is that I know that the total divergence out of this box has got to be zero. I know if I make the box small that the top and bottom are going to contribute nothing net to the divergence because electric field is going to be almost exactly the same top and bottom. Same for in and out of the page. But from left to right, it's not the electric field that stays consistent. It's n squared times electric field in that direction that stays consistent. That's this. Well, ex is the component perpendicular to the interface, and that immediately leads us to this equation. So this is one of the four Maxwell equations now explained at a boundary. There also are going to be relations that we will talk about and solve for on homework relating the perpendicular component of E, the perpendicular component of B, and the parallel, sorry, the parallel component of B, and the perpendicular component of B. And it's going to turn out, as I think you're going to be solving on homework, that all of these end up being equal to each other. Only the perpendicular component of the electric field has an interesting relationship involving the refractive index. And that's because electric field pushing in this direction will literally pull charge from this material N1 to the surface and pull charge away from the surface in material N2. There is no equivalent effect happening for magnetic field. In optics, are considering magnetic materials that have the same magnetic properties. They just have different dielectric properties, which is why we get an N1 and N2 effect.